They're all types of, because they have surround sound. Oh, really? Okay. Good evening. Okay. Hello, Toastmasters. Good morning. Yes, morning. Oh. I said good evening because I didn't get a lot of sleep last night. My name is Tim. I'll be your room facilitator today. And the session that we're at is... Um, with Jerry Evans from Fear to Fearless Speaking. I hope all of you are in the right class, but Jerry is our speaker and he is a self-proclaimed addict for public speaking. He has an affliction and affinity to speak as often as he can. It first um, began almost six years ago when he walked into his first Toastmasters meeting filled with self-doubt and lacking self-confidence to speak in front of groups of people. He contracted the speaking virus and has been gladly speaking, trying to infect other people to pass it on to others and to spread it to as many people as possible. Jerry is a passionate speaker, business owner, entrepreneur, and he started his own company. The awards company in 2005 after a successful corporate sales management career of 20 plus years in the consumer packaged goods industry. He describes himself as a former corporate slave and a refugee from Corpus America. He is most proud of the two black belt degrees he has earned, one in success and the other in failure. <laughs> the anxiety of speaking in front of an audience still frightens most people, which sometimes hold them back from reaching their potential personality personally and professionally. He will share how to overcome one of the most insidious challenges we face as speakers. It affects our confidence and ability to stand up and speak and stalls our courage to trust we have something of value to share with our audience. He will give us some steps, strategies, and techniques to control, listen, and management so we can be more competent, directed, and dynamic when we get up to speak. From fear to fearless to fun in speaking, please welcome distinguished Toastmaster, Mr. Jerry Evans. Thank you, Tim. So to get everybody started this morning, because I know it's early on a Saturday morning, and probably if I ask you, would you rather be somewhere else beside, you know, the Lace event and Willowbrook Inn? But in order to put us in the right mood, now we might disrupt the, 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 the meeting next door and, and the room after that, mm -hmm. so don't get alarmed. But we're going to get in a happy mood this morning. This is one of my favorite songs. And to those of you, perhaps, that attended Craig Deucewalt, his session last week, you know his background is in music. Well, I love music, and the first thing I do in the morning is I listen to something positive and uplifting. And this gentleman here certainly puts me in that mood, and I hope that it'll put you in that mood. So, Tim, crank it up and let it go. And if you feel like standing up and dancing, raising your energy level, please do so. Let it out. Thank you. 
your energy rise a little bit more? So see, now you're all clappers. You know how in a Toastmasters meeting, you know, we always clap? And clapping is a sign of encouragement, appreciation, and gratitude because that literally does raise the energy of a room when you're in a meeting. Have you ever gone to a meeting where everybody's just kind of sitting there and the energy's real low and you can sort of sense that in the room? It's like when Rudy, when I go to Motorola and Northwest Suburban Toastmasters, it's like when Rudy walks in the room, all of a sudden the energy level just goes up because of his presence in the room. So Rudy's here today and Deborah's here today, so that's awesome. But before we begin and get into the formal part of it, if you have one of these devices of meeting distraction, if you could put it on airplane mode or silent or vibrate, I would greatly appreciate that. <clears throat> Dr. Smedley said that we learn best in moments of fun and enjoyment. And I'm a firm believer in having fun in a meeting. And it doesn't matter whether it's a workshop, a session, a meeting, whatever the case may be. But if we're not having fun, what's the point of doing it? <coughs> now, a lot of you probably um, don't necessarily aspire to become a professional speaker. But we all are speakers and presenters. When you join the <coughs> masters, they say the two most important days of your life are the day that you were born and the day that you discover why you joined Toastmasters <laughs> and why you wanted to become a speaker or a presenter. And one of the things that goes along with that, of course, is that F word. Now, don't let your mind wander <laughs> into, the, into the other direction, but you think about that F word and it's a simple four-letter word, and that's F-E-A-R. And how that really is the core to the fear of failure of speaking. And especially in Toastmasters, because we all come to Toastmasters with a different set of skills and talents and gifts, and at different levels, not all Toastmasters are created equal. We know that. And as we go through the process and the educational program, you know, we learn our strengths and then those areas that we need to improve on. So today, what I'd like to do is I'd like to walk you through and give you some steps, some tips, some strategies that you can go back and when you're giving presentations, when you're speaking in general, it'll help you overcome some of that fear and that anxiety and that angst that we all have when we get up to speak. And I'm sure no one in this room has any of them, right? No nervousness, no angst, no anxiety. You know, you're all totally confident, self-assured when you get up to present. Well, that's typically not the case. So we're going to talk about from fear to fear less. Now, notice I don't say fearless but to fear less because as we get into this, you'll realize that nervousness and anxiety, channeling that is actually a good thing for you, and that's a positive, and we'll talk about how we do that. So we go from, are you a fearful speaker, presenter, and how do we go from being fearful to being confident when we're speaking and giving presentations? Does anyone know who this is? Yes. Yes. Jerry Seinfeld. Some of you may be familiar with this quote, but it probably kind of puts in perspective the fear of public speaking in general. There's truth in the old cliche that at a funeral, most people would rather be in the casket than the one giving the eulogy. Hmm. And how many times do we feel like that? Sometimes, if I'm listening to Rudy and he's hitting it, I mean, he's in the zone, I'm like, wow, he's really amazing today. And there's other times we might hear a speaker and you can see the nervousness, the anxiety, and the angst that they're, that they're suffering. And you go, God, I'm glad that I'm not him or her that's up there presenting. Because you feel bad for them. Your heart goes out to them because as speakers, and especially as an audience member, we want the speaker to be successful. We never want to see a speaker fail, no matter what. Because especially all of us who are in Toastmasters, and we support one another, we're just, you know, we're, we're there, we're almost as tense as they are. Because sometimes we can see when things aren't going 100% correct. They say that the mind is a terrible thing. From the moment we're born, we speak until we get up to speak in public. Because all of a sudden, all those things, all the ways that we prepared, and all the things we were going to do, and all of a sudden your mind just kind of goes blank. And that thought that you had, just goes out into the ether somewhere, yeah. doesn't it? And it doesn't matter sometimes, no matter how much you prepare. Yeah. You can prepare, prepare, prepare. Right, Deborah? Yes. 
So let's talk about the top 10 fears and how this relates to the fear of public speaking. Every year they publish a book of lists. And so about the top fears. Now I know a lot of you, probably the majority of you in this room, have heard that fear of public speaking is number one. That's not true. It's one of the top three fears, but it's not the number one fear. Fear of flying. Fear of public speaking. Fear of intimacy. Fear of death. Fear of failure. Fear of rejection. Fear of heights. Fear of the dark. Fear of spiders. And fear of commitment. I'm sure some of you have, probably have some of these fears. If not a couple of them, you might have a number of them. And so when we look down the list of different, of different fears, you notice fear of public speaking is number two. So we're going to talk about fear of public speaking. We're going to talk about fear of failure. And we're going to talk about fear of rejection and how those play into, <coughs> excuse me, how you speak and how you present. And the other one that's not up there is fear of the unknown. Because that also is one of the factors when we speak. But here's the crux of what we're going to talk about today. The fear of failure is core to the fear of public speaking. Now how does that play out? Do all of us in this room have some fear when we get up to speak? I mean, unless, I mean, am I the only one? Okay. I just want, I just want to make sure. So we're going to talk about how failure and how that is one of the core components and how we can overcome that, how we can lessen it, and how we can reduce it. And there's some practical things that we can do for that. So let's talk about fear, that four letter word fear. So what does fear really mean? Well, there's different interpretations or different definitions of it. And one of the definitions is, some of you may have heard of this, is false evidence appearing real. Because the fear of public speaking, honestly, it's like all the fears we have, it's mostly in our minds. And they say it starts with dread, it builds to anxiety, and soon we're stupefyingly frozen with fear when we stand up to speak up. Another definition might be fantasized experiences appearing real. And we'll review these again. So that's the other thing because false evidence appearing real, fantasized experience appearing real, but either one of these start in your mind. Because a lot of it's just imagined. Because someone said to me the other day, when they were giving a presentation, well, Jerry, I forgot something. You know, I skipped this, this, and this. I said, really? I said, did the audience, did they know your speech? They go, no. I said, then it doesn't really matter, does it? Because you know your speech better than they do. They don't know what you added or left out. So it doesn't really make any difference. The most important part of it, did you really convey the message that you came to deliver? And we'll talk about message in a moment. And then my favorite is forget everything and run. <laughs> because sometimes when we get up to speak, that's how we feel like, oh my God, I just want to exit the room. Maybe that window, maybe I can jump out of that window and land in the bushes and I'll be okay. So false evidence appearing real, fantasized experiences appearing real, forget everything and run. And there's one more, again, which I don't have up here, and that's failure expected and received. Because we have that expectations, again, sometimes in our mind, and it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. We set ourselves up, like, oh my God, we think the worst. What if this presentation doesn't go well? We'll talk about that in detail. So false evidence appearing real. So we're not alone. Everyone even experiences has some fear or anxiety when speaking in front of the groups. And they really shouldn't because stage fright must be learned. Because did you know that we only have two natural fears at birth? Can anyone guess what those are? Fear of falling and loud noises. Exactly. Great. Fear of falling and fear of loud noises. So consequently, if that, those are only two natural fears, then it stands to reason everything else is learned. Because either from your parents, from society, from your teachers, from clergy, whatever it might be, societal conditioning, it's all learned. And we create that imaginary fear in our minds. That doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't manifest itself, manifest itself physically, but again, most of it is in our minds. And so just to give you an idea of some of the people who 
have nervousness, anxiety, and fear when they get up to speak and or sing. Does anyone know who that is? She's a famous singer-songwriter. That's Carly Simon. Oh. Right. So before she gets up to give a concert, she paces back and forth. She's sweating like crazy. And she's wondering, you know, how am I ever going to do this? And next thing you know, boom, she's out on stage and she starts performing. Probably the one of the most famous singers of all time, Barbara Streisand. Barbara Streisand has got a phenomenal voice. We've all heard her sing, and she's done concerts all over the world. And she started, I think, when she was 17 or 18 years old. And yet still to this day, she admits that she has nervousness and stage fright before she goes on to headline an important event. After all these years, Carol Burnett, some of you in the room are mature enough to remember Carol Burnett. Carol Burnett had one of the most <coughs> successful, longest running variety shows on television, and yet before she got it, before she went on, she would go backstage and she would upchuck before she performed almost every single time. And she was on television for a long, long time. The boss, Bruce Springsteen, same kind of deal. Before he gets ready to go on stage, he paces back and forth, sweats coming off his brow like condensation on a soda can. He's pacing like a nervous cat, but before you know it, he knows in his experience, when he gets out on that stage, he's ready to rock. And he gives the crowd a phenomenal performance. So Bruce Springs. Mel Gibson, famous actor, director, again, nervousness and stage fright before he did performance. But this is probably my most favorite because, of course, now we know Jimmy Fallon took over for Jay Leno, and of course, preceding Jay Leno was Johnny Carson, The Tonight Show. Johnny was on television for 25 years, but here's what we didn't know about Johnny. He was an avid tennis player. He played tennis three or four times a week. His standing heart rate, or I'm sorry, his resting heart rate was 65 beats per minute. Now, he was really into health and nutrition, so before he would go on, his doctor would hook up the blood pressure machine, and they would check his heart rate. So, resting heart rate was 65, Right before Ed McMahon would say, and here's Johnny, Johnny's blood pressure would shoot up to 165 beats per minute before he walked through that curtain. Now keep in mind, he was working with the same staff, the same production people, everybody else for 20-some years, so it wasn't like, you know, everybody had changed. But before he walked through that curtain, every single night, they hooked him up, 65, his blood pressure would jump up to 165. Now, as soon as he walked through the curtain, did we see a nervous Johnny Carson? No. no, he seemed relaxed, he seemed at ease. So imagine if Johnny Carson, after all those years, how does that impact us? Is the answer, just like Nike, just do it. Deborah, just get up and do it. It doesn't matter if you're nervousness, your fear, your anxiety, just get up and give that speech. Just get up and give that presentation. Right, <laughs> right. It's not, it's, unfortunately, it's not that simple. So my question to all of you, are you prepared? Are you prepared? How many of you are newer Toastmasters, meaning less than a year? Okay, two years or more. Five years or more. Okay, we, we sort of have a mix. So I'm going to gear this towards the new folks, people in the middle, and those of us who are a little bit farther along, because it really applies to all of us. I'm going to talk to you about the five P's. Rudy, I think, has heard me talk about this before. I like P's. Some of us like fewer P's, and some of us like more P's. I'm going to talk to you about the five P's, and it, it goes to preparation. If we went around the room and surveyed each and every one of you, what would be your number one fear? Anyone? What would be your number one fear when it comes to speaking and presenting? Forgetting my speech. Okay. Blanking, forgetting your speech. What else? Okay. What was that one? Audience not liking the subject. Audience not liking the subject. What else? One more. Freezing, panicking. Okay. Blanking when you're speaking. Okay. That's it. That's enough of preparation. Bingo. Most of the time, most of our nervousness and our anxiety and our anger really begins with preparation. 
because that's probably the easiest and simplest thing that you can do to overcome the anxiety and the fear when it comes to speaking. In fact, I'll tell you this, it's 75% of it. 75% is preparation, 15% is breathing, which we'll get into, and the remaining 10% is mindset, is your attitude about the presentation. But 75% is preparation. The five P's, proper preparation prevents presentation predicaments. Proper preparation prevents presentation predicaments. Because those of us who fail to prepare are really preparing to not give a great presentation. And here's the bad news for all of you who want to lessen your fear and your anxiety with public speaking. You ready for this? Yes. There is no magic pill. There is no silver bullet how to fix that or how to do that. I really wish there were. And you know, all those pharmaceutical companies, maybe they have some drug and clinical trials that can help us do that, but I wouldn't necessarily wait until it's developed in order to do that. But the five Ps, proper preparation prevents presentation predicaments. In my experience, and I'm sure a lot of you in this room, we create our own anxiety when we know we aren't properly prepared and we don't properly practice and rehearse. Because you can see it in your clubs, you can see it when you've gone to a seminar or workshop, when someone isn't really familiar with the material, you know they didn't put a lot of prep and preparation into it, and so that nervousness shows through. And those of us who've been in Toastmasters for any length of time, we might refer to them as stoplight speeches, pocket speeches, walking through the door speeches, in the parking lot, sitting in your car, writing the speech before you come into a meeting. Is that going to lessen your anxiety or increase your anxiety before you give that speech or presentation? Increase. It's going to increase it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I don't necessarily recommend that. Now, table topics, that's a different, different conversation when we're asked to speak you know, off the cuff and extemporaneously. But whether it's Jim Key, whether it's Prez Vasilev, whether it's Darren LaCroix, whether it's Craig Valentine, whether it's Patricia Fripp, each and all the world champions, and anyone who's a professional speaker would tell you the time and the hours that they go into preparing before they give a presentation, they give a speech. Uh, are all of you familiar with Malcolm Gladwell? No. Yes. The 10,000 hour rule, Caesar? <clears throat> tell them what the 10,000 hour rule is. Well, it's a concept that basically says if you do anything for 10,000 hours, right, you become an expert at it. Right. So in speaking and in presenting, now, you're probably not going to devote 10,000 hours to it, but here's the, here's the key, is that for every minute that you speak, they say an hour of preparation. Now, I know a lot of you are thinking, Jerry, that's a lot of time to, to invest in putting together a presentation or a speech. Well, let's say Rudy's given a keynote presentation. Do you think that's a good investment of Rudy's time, energy, and effort? Especially if they're going to pay him a lot of money to give that presentation? they expect a result. Because if he is a professional speaker it comes unprepared, or Tim Wilson's giving a presentation, he isn't going to get invited back to speak. Because he has an obligation or responsibility to his audience to give them full value for the time that they invested to come and hear his speech, his presentation. So an hour of preparation for every minute that you speak. That's just kind of a general rule of thumb, but think about that. Focus. We kind of have to narrow, we go from you know, fear and then narrowing down to our focus. And another way, because I like acronyms and it's an easy way to remember certain concepts and, and things, is that if you think about focus, and how we're talking about false evidence appearing real, fantasized outcomes appearing real, and that sort of thing, well focus, think of it this way. Fantasized outcomes creating unlimited success. So when you shift from fear to focus, you create success when you're presenting or when you're speaking. It's just a mind shift. Instead of thinking, what's the worst can happen with my speech or presentation, shift your focus to what's the best possible outcome. Because we all have those mental gremlins, those border bullies, that little inner conversation going in our head, right? Are, none of you, you don't have those voices? <laughs> and they whisper to you. They're the speaking whisperer. And 
sometimes we become our own worst enemies and we're of course we know we're our worst critics and it goes back to preparation so if you prepare and then you narrow your focus then you'll have a successful outcome follow one course until successful is another way of looking at it Eve mentioned about topic subject well here's kind of Evan's rule of thumb when it comes to, and I think Tim, Tim has said this, and I remember something Tim said to me a long time ago when I heard first step do a, do a session, and he was talking about the greatest fear is, or the greatest death is being talked about. So when we hear speakers get up and give a presentation where, my God, you know, where's the red card? We want them to finish even before they started because they're just babbling. They're not really saying anything, giving us anything of value. And so the value that we bring as speakers, number one, is knowing, of course, your subject. Talking about something that you're passionate about, that you really care about, that it's a message that the audience can benefit from. So it doesn't matter whether you're speaking to inform, to entertain, to persuade, etc., but having a powerful, compelling message. That's number one. Because if you don't care about the subject matter or topic, how enthusiastic, energetic are you going to be about delivering it to the audience? If you're just kind of going through the motions. But when we're passionate about something, then it changes the game. And here's something, you know, when we talk about, you know, Prez, Prez is a technician. Prez breaks down every single thing when it comes to a speech. Now, not all of us can be technical speakers or, you know, really technicians and break speeches down to that nth degree. Tim talks about storytelling and he gives you some elements of how to be a good storyteller. Well, if you're not a technician, the thing that I would suggest to you is that then be a passionate speaker because passion trumps technique any day of the week. And even if you flub your lines, if you forget something, uh, you didn't come out and deliver it the way you exactly planned to do it, if you let that passion, that excitement, and that energy show through, the audience is very forgiving because the audience is really on our side. They want us to succeed. They want us to be successful. So think about passion. Okay. What if? Let me back up. So three things. I talked about, you know, earlier when I showed that the ten fears. I said we talked about the fear of public speaking, right? And I said we would talk about the fear of failure and then the fear of rejection. So let's just get it out there. Let's jump into the, say, the freezing cold vortex, except now we're in a warm vortex in, in summer right now. The fear of public speaking is really the fear of looking like a fool in public and looking like you're not in control. And that boils down to one thing. What do you think that is? Fear of rejection. That's one of the things. But it's really fear of, oh my God, what is Eve going to think about me? Well, guess what? Can I control what Eve thinks about me? Can you control what Tim thinks about you or Tim Bolger thinks about you? I don't think so. So what's the solution? What's the antidote to that? Number one, to believe in yourself and your own thoughts of self. Because again, it goes back to message. If you don't believe in the message that you're delivering, and the value it has to the audience, then they're not going to believe in you. So it's really the fear of what other people think about you. And I can tell you from my six years in Toastmasters, I've seen that happen again and again and again. People get so wrapped up in, oh my God, what are they going to think? There's no control over that, Tim. And you can also switch the focus. When you focus Correct. on yourself, you get nervous. You focus on the audience. Right. Your nerves go away. Tim brings up an excellent point, which we'll, we'll cover before we're done here. So yeah, when you shift that focus to the audience and get out of your own head, and again, the message and the value that you bring to the audience, again, it changes the game. It totally changes the game. So fear of public speaking. Fear of failure. Ah, the fear of failure. The fear of starting something just in case we don't succeed in finishing it. Well, if we all had that fear as children, would we have learned to walk for the first time? 
How about speak? Or to pretty much do anything that we take for granted today as an adult. So to me, this fear of failure is really a myth. Because I believe the only way any of us can truly fail is when we quit, when we totally give up. Now, I've got another way of looking at it. I call it separation anxiety. Now, all of us are in Toastmasters. There's any non-Toastmasters here this morning? No, so we're all Toastmasters. I call it separation anxiety, and that's when our butts have to separate from the chair. Mm. <laughs> so we have to get up, stand up, and we have to speak up. So we have that fear of failure. And you know, while I, st while I agree that, that, it, that it's a real fear for a lot of people, it really isn't because nobody has a fear of quitting, do they? Right. Yeah. So if the only way you can fail is if you quit, and there's no such thing as fear of quitting, it doesn't make sense. So logically, the fear of failing doesn't make sense either. Now, what's the antidote to fear of failure? Remember that slide where it said Nike? And it said, just do it? So, go on, just do it. Because you see, one person's debilita debilitating fear becomes another person's motivating fuel. Debilitating fear, motivating fuel. And if you're so wrapped up in failing, then Toastmasters, we don't come to Toastmasters to fail. That's another misperception. Because truly, there are no failures, no mistakes in Toastmasters. Jerry, oh my God, that's sacrilegious. How can you say that? There are lessons to be learned, and there are moments of discovery. Because we learn what we're really good at, what our strengths are, those areas that we need improvement. We could have a long conversation about all the tools that we could use to become better speakers and presenters. All those come into it. But really, it's about us learning and growing. And we know when we go to the clubs and attend the meeting, get engaged, that we grow as a result of that and we continuously learn. And in my six years in Toastmasters, I call it my journey of learning because I'm always going and I'm always growing. And I'm always learning from something, from someone, no matter who is presenting or who's speaking. The third thing, because Tim mentioned it, is the fear of rejection. Who's ever been in a relationship? Who's in a relationship? Have you ever been rejected? We probably all have been rejected in a relationship at one time or another, right? We felt that rejection pain, and we said, I'm never going to let this pain, I'm never going to let this happen to me again. And yet sometimes it does, and we can learn from that experience. Because even though it's painful, most importantly, we all survived. We didn't die from it. It wasn't fatal. It wasn't final. And you might have the heartbreak and the pain of that. But eventually, you get over it and you move on. And sometimes we feel that, again, that fear of public speaking, fear of failure, fear of rejection and Toastmasters when we're speaking. But ultimately, we all get over it. And we've heard that cliche. Practice makes what? Perfect. perfect. But I would ask you, does it make perfect? <clears throat> makes it better. Yes or yes or no or no? No. 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 Because if Tim gives the perfect speech, is there room for improvement? If he literally gives the perfect speech, is there room for improvement? Is there no. room for growth? Or is there room for progress? No. Nobody's perfect, but every one of us can improve. And that goes back to fear of failure sometimes because we feel like, you know, we have to be perfect when we speak. You don't have to be perfect, you just have to be present. You have to be you, I have to be me. You can't be a successful imitation of another successful speaker. Because each and every one of us you're unique in your own style and your own delivery. You have a unique message. And what's your name? Roman. 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 Yes. Can I speak like you? No. No. Especially not <coughs> this morning. Right. <laughs> can, can you speak like me? It's not because spirits. I'm just getting it. <laughs> no, I cannot speak like you right. either. 
So we can't speak like one another. Eve could deliver a message, and someone in the audience needs to hear Eve deliver that message. I could deliver the same message, and it falls on deaf ears. It doesn't resonate. Rudy could tell the story about his father with compassion, with love, with honesty, with great emotion. I could tell that same story, and it might fall flat. Because number one, I haven't lived that story. He has. So be true to who you are as a speaker. Don't try to be a successful imitation of some other speaker. And be true to your message. What if? Not too long ago, I was in District 54, and Rudy, he and I were down there giving, uh, presenting different sessions. So Jim Key, who's our keynote speaker today, Jim Key was the keynote speaker. I followed Jim Key. And then... Jim Key followed me, and then Rudy followed Jim Key. So Jim Key, Jerry, Jim Key, Rudy, we each followed one another. And I was really nervous about giving this presentation because this was the first time I had given this presentation, and all the district leadership happened to be at the session. We'd attended to the sessions. I thought, oh my God, I just, I gotta follow Jim Key. He's a world champion of public speaking, and how am I ever gonna pull this off? So all those metal gremlins started going off in my head, and Jerry, you know, what's this gonna and then I had to kind of center myself and focus because I thought, well, Jim Key can't deliver my message because he doesn't know my presentation. No more than I can deliver his presentation. So I came up with this idea, and I call it the what ifs. So what if? What if the last speaker was outstanding and compared to them, I suck. <laughs> so what? Who cares? It doesn't matter. Because if you play the comparison game between yourself and another speaker, there's no win-win. We lose. Because again, you're trying to be an imitation of someone else and not being true to who you are as a speaker. So that dawned on me pretty quickly. You know, hey, don't worry about Jim Key. Just focus on your own presentation and do the best you can possibly do. Thanks, Ted, with that. East Point, what if the audience doesn't like me? Well, guess what? Not 100% of the audience is going to like me. And if you get worried about Tim's, you know, if we talk about the audience, again, the message and the value that you bring to the audience. If there's 100 people in the room, 1,000 people, and 10,000 people in the room, it really doesn't matter. Because you're not, the message is not going to resonate with 100% of the people. It might be 60%, 65%, 70%, who knows? The next time you deliver it, you could just wow them to death. And other times, I, even some of the world champions, They'll give you example after example where those speeches they've given it numerous times, for whatever reason, it just sort of falls flat because it's a different audience. Maybe they're not in the mood, the energy level, all kind of things. So you don't worry about if the audience doesn't like it. What if I was talking too quickly? Well, we know there's tools, there's ways, techniques we can we can overcome that and slow down and the power of the pause we know. What if I was talking too slowly? You're going to bore the audience to death. That's what's going to happen. So if you don't strike well in the first three and a half minutes, stop boring. Because you'll go from boardroom to bore the audience room. What if I forgot something, a slip of the tongue? So what? Again, does the audience know your speech? No. They don't know your speech. If you left a paragraph out, if you left a sentence out, or sometimes you get so hung up on a word, so what? It doesn't really matter. Again, focus on the message and focus on the audience. Get out of your head and focus on what's in the what's in the audience. What if everyone laughs at you again? Who cares? Maybe that's a good thing because you gave a really funny line, you added humor to the presentation, <laughs> and now you engage the audience on a different level. So humorous is a good is a good thing. What if, this is probably my biggest what if. What if I've got nothing to say, come on, oops. What if I've got nothing to say, for some reason the other part of it didn't, what if I've got nothing to say that anyone would ever have an interest in hearing? Lots of people have that what if, and they really should. Because everyone in this room has experiences and knowledge that others would benefit from having presented to them. And sometimes as speakers and presenters, we can't see that 
in ourselves. We have to have someone else point it out to us. Have you ever had that, that thought? Oh God, I don't know if my message, it's really going to be a value to them. But that goes back to, again, if you're passionate about your subject and topic, and it's really something you think that you want to share with the audience and they could benefit from, again, it goes back to the preparation part. So don't worry about that part. So let's talk about step strategy techniques as we're at the red mark at this point. Step strategy techniques to relax before speaking. To know the audience. I spoke to a number of you before you know, the, the session started today. So if you're presenting outside of Toastmasters, you want to make sure that you arrive early. I know Tim does this, Rudy does this, Deborah does that, a lot of you I'm sure do that for you to go to make a, a speaking event. Because this way you get to know the makeup of the room, number one, because today we had to shift the room because the whole room was open, and all of a sudden they shrunk it down to three rooms. So instead of presenting to this big room, now it's a smaller room. So you want to make sure you get to know the audience as much as you can, you know, kind of meet and mingle the people before you start. That's the way you can also refer to different people. Know your material. Can't emphasize that enough. Because when you're again, when you properly and thoroughly prepare yourself before you get up to speak and you know the material inside and out. So the question arises sometimes, well, Jerry, how much should I practice? How much should I, you know, rehearse my material? And this is what I would say to you. To rehearse it and practice as much as it takes you to really drill the information and to where you internalize it rather than memorize it. There's a big difference. Because if you're just working from memory and you forget something, it's not that you won't anyway, but if you're just strictly working from memory and you've got, you know, you're on track, I do this and I do this and I do this and all of a sudden you blank, you'll get lost in the presentation. And all of a sudden you're standing in front of the group and it's like you're trying to recover and we've all seen speakers who they just stop. And it takes a really excellent speaker to recover from something like that. So to know your material. Learn how to relax. So how to relax. I said that we talked about the three things. 75% is preparation, 15% is breathing. When you speak and you're projecting to a large, or you're speaking to a larger room, you need to project. If you're speaking from your upper chest, you're going to have a hard time projecting, plus you're going to run out of energy, as opposed to speaking from your diaphragm. Because, you know, like you, you test your breathing, and you can see when your abdomen rises and falls, rises and falls. Or if your pitch, depending on your personal tone, is high or low or somewhere in the middle, if you're speaking from your upper chest, it tends to be higher. And you can't project as much. And then if, especially if you're doing a 45, 50 or longer presentation, you're going to kind of run out of wind. So you really need to practice diaphragm, diaphragmatic breathing. And that's something you can do. People realize people want you to succeed. The audience is on our side. They want us to be interesting, they want us to be informative, they want us to be entertaining, they want us to be stimulating, but most importantly, all audiences, it doesn't matter who the audience is, they want us to succeed as speakers and presenters. And it doesn't matter if you're a newbie, in the middle, or farther along in the journey. The audience is on our side. As I said earlier, you know, if you see a speaker struggling, your heart goes out to them because, oh man, you know, and you want them to, you want them to pick up and recover. As I said, concentrate on the message, not the media. Focus on your message. Because when you focus on your message and you deliver value, it doesn't matter if Rudy's speaking, Tim's speaking, Deborah's speaking, Eve's speaking, any of us are speaking, if we're really delivering value, focusing on our message. Message matters. Because that also, if you know your audience, if you know your material, you know your message backwards and forwards. If I woke you up in the middle of the night and I said, okay, give me your speech or give me your presentation. That's how prepared you need to be. You don't even have to think about it. You can deliver that message. Boom, 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 boom. Visualize yourself speaking successfully. Before you get up to speak, we go back to the breathing part. Number one, you want to breathe because oxygen is important to our life, number one. And if you don't breathe, you're probably going to pass out. But you want to center yourself and breathe before you get up to speak. 
Because how many times have we seen speakers, as soon as they stand up, you notice I didn't start right away. You kind of take a moment to center yourself, compose yourself, kind of breathe, and then start delivering your presentation or your speech. But to visualize yourself speaking confidently, assuredly, visualize the audience clapping for you as you walk up to the lectern, visualize them applauding when you're done, and visualize yourself speaking to the audience successfully. So if you do that, I guarantee you, you will be successful. Visualization, almost all the best speakers will practice visualization. And gain experience. Toastmasters is a learn by doing. It's like OJT, on the job training. The more that we do it, the more relaxed we become, and the more relaxed we become, the better we get. The better we get. And so take and, take and make as many speaking opportunities as you possibly can. It doesn't matter where they're at or what, because by doing that, that'll, gain, that'll, that'll stretch your comfort zone, and each time you stretch your comfort zone, you will increase your self-confidence every single time. And there's no substitute for the experience. Um, one last thing, stories. I know Tim, I know Rudy, Deborah, a lot of us, and you've heard Prez talk about in your own world champions. I can't emphasize stories enough because if you think of your speech as a song and what you write down as the lyrics and how you say it is everything. Because that can add color, that can add texture, all sorts of different things to, to the speech. And if we think of the greatest speeches in history, the 20th and 21st century, if you think of the Gettysburg Address, Martin Luther King, one of the greatest speeches ever, and probably the Gettysburg Address, one of the shortest speeches ever, 280 words, if memory serves me correctly, they weren't spinning plates, they weren't juggling, they weren't worrying about the speaking area. Most of them, FDR, etc., JFK, they were behind the lectern, but it's the power of the story, the power of the words, that they were using. So that shows, goes back to message, if you have a powerful, compelling message, how dynamic that can be. So think about your stories when you're crafting your speeches. Guts. I asked you earlier on, are you prepared? So I ask you this, do you have the guts? I'm not talking about the physical guts per se, but to go use this stuff. Have you seen the Staples button? This is hit that go button and go use this stuff. If you give me your email address, or I'll give you my card, I will gladly email you because uh, the format for this the slides is a little bit different, so I kind of breeze through some of them. I will send you the PowerPoint, and I'll send you some other materials. Uh, for those of you at the beginning of your journey in Toastmasters, for those of you kind of in the middle, and for those of you that are farther along, this fear of public speaking is really, sometimes we make it more complicated than it really needs to be. And the more that you believe in yourself and your message and be true to who you are and not try to be someone else, the more successful you're going to be, not only in Toastmasters, but outside of Toastmasters. Okay. Because when I started six years ago, I had some background in public speaking, but I never would have guessed that six years later how much I would have grown, how much I've learned, and by going to these seminars and workshops and applying, whether it's listening to Rudy or Tim or listening to Perez, the other world champions, a public speaker, I finally decided that all that's great, I admire them, I've been inspired by them, but then you have to take all that information and you have to apply it to what works for you. Not all of it is going to work for everyone, but if you take one nugget of information, that helps you overcome that angst and that anxiety and that fear, so the next time you get up to speak and you think about fear and what that means, or you think about focus, and how you can create that successful outcome. Okay. And just take some of the simple steps. It'll take your speaking to a whole different level. Go visit other clubs. Get outside of the confines of your own club. Visit another club. Go to Rudy's, go to Deborah's, Tim's, Extreme Toastmasters, Advanced Clubs. All right. And listen to other speakers and take the best of the best and then apply it to your speaking. So you'll go from fear to fear less in speaking. Okay. So thank you for your attention this afternoon. Have a great rest of your day, and Tim, I'll let you in. You guys got the evaluation forms? Please leave them here. Let's give one more hand to Jerry.
if you give me if you give me your email address, I'll recommend some great books for you. Uh, for those of you who speak to businesses or companies, organizations, it's called Tell to Win. One of the ones some of you may follow is Gary Denard called Fearless Speaking. It's a brand new book. It just came out with it. And it talks about a lot of the things that I talked about okay. today. Five okay. minutes to our next session. we yeah. got to take it down. Thank you guys very much for attending. Can we, are those books for purchase if you choose to? No, these are mine, but I will, oh. if you give me your email address, I'll send you a whole list of different ones.